Welcome to In the Hot Seat with the Tenney Group. I'm Spencer Tenney. It's good to be with you. Today we have an excellent guest on our show, Ryan Erickson from McGriff. He's going to talk to us a little bit, a little bit about captives. Ryan, welcome to the hot seat. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. All right. Before we heat things up a little bit, I understand that you're the executive vice president over there. Beyond that, tell us a, bit, a little bit about what you're doing for McGriff uh, and how you're serving the trucking industry. Well, I've been with McGriff for uh, 15 years, about a year after our transportation practice uh, was developed uh, back in 2006. And uh, really, I, I serve many roles here at McGriff, uh, partial leadership over our transportation practice, uh, really spend most of my time dealing with clients and prospects, uh, really of all uh, shapes and sizes, uh, really in all kind of modes of transportation from large truckload LTL asset-based carriers to uh, the last mile and, and, and really everything in between uh, dealing with both corporate type placements and building independent contractor and aggregator programs for, uh, for folks to touch a lot of uh, small operators. Well, wonderful. So uh, you ready to heat things up a little bit? Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. So recently I had the pleasure of seeing you and another um, fellow hot seat contributor, Dan Cook of True North Companies co-present uh, a presentation about captive insurance programs. It was very fascinating, but it also brought some attention about some uh, wide misunderstandings about um, these solutions that are available to the trucking industry. So let's just start there. What are, or maybe what's the one largest misconceptions about captives? Yeah, so I think the largest misconception is is quite a, a general misconception, and that and that captives will, will just you know, basically help, you know, help you save money. Uh, you know, people think if you just throw a captive at it, that, that all of a sudden you're going to save money and that's going to solve all of your problems. And really, uh, captives are, are utilized in, in so many different ways in by so many different types of transportation companies for so many different types of reasons that 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 misnomer is is really kind of a very, very difficult thing to overcome because a lot of people think you can just throw a captive at it and that'll solve the problem. So let's just back up a little bit for those um, of our audience that are, are not as familiar with captives. What is a captive and what would be the reason for a transportation business owner use it, utilizing it? Yeah. So from a very high level, a captive is no different than, than anything uh, different than an insurance company. So uh, the formation of a captive is effectively a business or an enterprise uh, starting an insurance company. There are generally two, two different types of main captives for a, a, a single entity to form. Uh, one's known as an 831A elective captive, which is probably the most commonly used within the transportation industry for large uh, motor carriers in an 831B captive, which, which really is more of a tax strategy. Uh, utilized by some larger carriers, but but uh, but that's more focused on 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 on, on typically private businesses. Let, let's talk about traditional profiles. Who who are the, the what are the characteristics of of trucking companies that find themselves saying that as part of our risk management solution strategy, we need to consider a captive in some form, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to break that down into kind of a couple of different categories, and let's call it the the large fleet. Um, you know, the definition of what a large fleet is re really, really differs. And so I'm not going to put any context around it, but it folks that are taking on a significant risk that are paying significant premiums into the market. And then there's also kind of a, a you know, much larger subset of what I'll call medium fleet operators. And uh, we'll, use, uh, uh, we'll just use 100 trucks and larger uh, for that. And they really have very different reasons why they use captives. So let me start with the large fleet. Uh, number one, um, you know, building a captive uh, requires you to, to participate in some of the risk, and it requires you to have third-party risk for the IRS to consider it tax deductible. So historically speaking, you know, lots, lots of enterprises have established single-parent captives for tax efficiency reasons. Um, in a large deductible structure, when you're retaining a considerable portion of the risk, it'll take years for that actual claim payment to occur. And so uh, you have to hold that on your books as an accrual, and you can't take the, the, the tax deductibility of that claims payment. Uh, people will utilize single parent captives and actually pay premium into the captive to then basically take that at, as a tax deductible expense uh, versus keeping it on their books for years. And so that's, that's, that's one primary reason that, that a large uh, motor carrier might, might use a, a single parent captive. 
another reason that that probably is 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 not as popular nowadays is is just access to the market. As an insured, uh, you have access to the insurance market. These are the admitted uh, domestic carriers here in the U.S. Uh, by a actually building your own insurance company, you can expand that market access uh, to actually have access to some of the reinsurance markets uh, here, both domestically and abroad. And you know that. And that does expand the market for you, but but candidly, uh, the reinsurance market has been more challenging than uh, than the actual insurance market itself, and so that's not a a a, a major advantage. Um, another reason that that large motor carriers use uh, captives is to manage collateral. So, but the past ten years, a, a lot of motor carriers have established what's known as a risk retention group, uh, which is a licensed insurance company uh, based on the Risk Retention Act of 1986, uh, uh, where you can actually build a licensed insurance company based domestically. Uh, top domiciles include places like South Carolina, in Montana, and Vermont. And by setting up these risk retention groups, uh, uh, you can actually issue these public liability filings on behalf of you, the insured, uh, versus of the insurance company. And so you, you can help improve the credit risk with your insurance company, thus, thus negating collateral. Let's just un unpack that a little bit I, because there's a lot of folks that don't understand just how it functions. So, so what about the relationship? Like if you are um, integrating a captive into your broader insurance solution, functionally, what, what are they experiencing that's different from your traditional uh, insurance uh, risk solution product. Yeah, so it, in a trust, in a traditional risk solutions product, uh, you are taking whatever retention you choose to take. Um, you're then transferring risk to your underwriter, uh, whomever that is. Uh, because of the FMCSA and, and state level requirements for financial responsibility, your insurance company has to issue these filings on your behalf uh, to basically guarantee claims payment uh, to the public. Uh, uh, with the FMCSA, uh, that can range anywhere from 750 up to 5 million, uh, depending on the type of operation that you are. Uh, the states are, are, are typically one, you know, one in 5 million. So in that traditional insurance environment, uh, that creates a credit exposure because whoever your insurance company is, it, it is basically guaranteeing claims that you intend to retain as the insured. So uh, that, that will trigger a, a collateral requirement uh, from that insurance company to that insured, which over time, as policy years build up, uh, can become very meaningful. And that creates a challenge with the insurance relationship over time because you get, uh, you get a bunch of your collateral tied up with a specific insurance company. If you elected to move from that insurance company five, six years down the road, that insurance company is not going to give you that collateral back on day one. In fact, it, it will take several years as those legacy claims years develop for that, that collateral to be returned. And so you get into uh, what we call collateral jail, meaning it's very difficult to go to another insurance company because of that transaction. Uh, so that's a major, major constraint for portability and leverage with your insurance company. Uh, so where, uh, where I was going with the risk retention group is you, you can set up a licensed insurance company in a number of different states. Uh, there are states that are more favorable environments than others, and, and South Carolina, Montana, and Vermont are uh, three examples of that. Uh, but, but you basically build and create the, this insurance company. Uh, you can retain as much or as little of the risk as, as you want and, and reinsure the rest or, or take most of the risk yourself. And then you can issue those filings on your behalf. Uh, so what that does with your dynamic with your insurance company is you're eliminating the need for your insurance company to actually issue those filings. And thus, they don't have a need for collateral because the insurance policy goes from a deductible policy to an excess auto policy. So, so that's an example of how you're creating portability for yourself in the insurance market because five, six years down the road, if you feel you need to make a change in the relationship, uh, you're not in that collateral jail or collateral burden. Uh, there's another benefit to that too, is is just the frictional cost itself. So, uh, number one, you're you're tying up your letter of credit, uh, which could be used for other business operations. Uh, number two, there's a cost associated with that, and so you need to be a large enough size to justify the frictional cost of operating a captive, uh, or you need to be 
in a financial position uh, where you're leveraged enough that uh, that those additional expenses make sense to you. No, oh, that's great color right there. So for for those that have already identified, like it makes sense for me to be in a group captive. How does one go about selecting the right uh, group captive, considering they're going to be sharing risk? I mean. That seems like that might be kind of daunting. Yeah. So, so just to kind of break things up a little bit, and so this this risk retention strategy that I talked about, this that this tax efficiency strategy, you know, access to the reinsurance market strategy, uh, these are really focused on you know the the larger motor carrier space. You know, folks generally speaking that that are running over a thousand vehicles. You know, folks that are generating a a a very large total cost of risk. You know, that's a small subset of the motor carrier population. Most of the companies kind of fall into the category of uh, uh, needing or potentially using a group captive. There are much different reasons for a group captive for a, uh, for a medium fleet risk than a single parent for a larger risk. So as a medium fleet risk, uh, group captives are a, a version of a captive where, uh, where a collection of like-minded in individuals form this, this insurance company themselves. Uh, there are two different types of, of group captives. Uh, there are homogeneous, which is the most common, uh, similar businesses in similar industries, and heterogeneous, uh, which would be uh, businesses of all different types of industries. And you know, typically, you know, anywhere from 10 to 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 as many as 50 and 60 companies uh, will all participate in building and owning this captive. Um, the, the number one benefit from my perspective is control. Uh, so, so these companies will all own this insurance company that they control. Um, if you just look at a general insurance company itself, it, it's no different than a group captive. Uh, however, uh, you're, uh, you're doing business in sharing risk with a bunch of companies that you don't know and you have no control you know, over the underwriting and risk management functions of those companies. Group captives are folks that, that are all like-minded, that are focused on safety and risk management, uh, that are focused on improving performance, uh, so that you're putting yourself in, in somewhat of an insurance company that has a better risk profile than, than that of one at which you don't have control. Um, uh, so there is a major advantage from a cost perspective, because if you look at a, you know, I call it 20 companies that all run 200 trucks, they can all go to the insurance market themselves and buy excess coverage together. And when I mean excess coverage, I'm, I'm talking about the risk transfer cost that's above the captive retention. So uh, just as an example, uh, you know, these, these 20, two, you know, 200 unit motor carriers might elect to take the first $400,000 of, of every claim. That's what the captive I insurance company uh, would participate in. The rest above that, you know, 400,000 and up to, to 2 million or, or 5 million is in reinsurance, uh, uh, is in reinsured in the market. So, so the cost of that risk transfer premium above the $400,000 is significantly less for that 200 operator when negotiating with 20 other operators, you know, versus going to the market by themselves. As that 200 unit motor carrier grows and, and becomes 500 and then 1,000 units, that, that, that economy of scale benefit really deteriorates uh, because the, the, the downside of group captives is that there is a risk sharing component. So y you will pay for other people's claims. Uh, the goal is to evaluate a captive that, that manages that process accordingly, meaning that, that, that they're funding appropriately for those claims. And then when, uh, when they see deterioration, uh, uh, they're getting the rate increases uh, that they need to do it. So uh, number one, uh, when you're evaluating captives, what's the historical risk sharing performance? So it, uh, does it fall within say two to say 6% of, of, of total premium? You know, uh, when it starts to get over 6%, uh, you start to be concerned. Who are the vendors that, that, that the group captive uses? You know, who, who is the captive manager? You know, who, you know, who is the claims administrator? What, what, what dedication do they have uh, at the safety at, at, and risk management? What, you know, what dedication do the other members have you know, uh, uh, dedicated uh, uh, to technology? Uh, because the ultimate goal is to fund the captive losses and then ultimately get it a dividend you know, or return premium. I hope that our audience was just writing down those questions word for word as you were just talking to those because those are excellent um, screening questions that I hope um, – 
you know, our, our friends in this industry are using as they're trying to advance their current position. So let's talk about the future. So insurance market just this crazy the last five years, um, all kinds of new risk entering the market right now. How do you see the next five years and, 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 and to, to what degree will captive programs um, help um, the transportation industry solve some of these uh, increasing risk? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, 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 the tax advantages of a single parent captive for a large motor carrier have, have, have really deteriorated since the tax environment you know, has changed a bit. Um, I, I, I see the most use for captives right now for large motor carriers in a couple of different ways. Uh, the excess market continues to be very challenged for these large motor carriers that I'll classify as targeted defendants. Uh, so I think that they're picked on a little bit more than the medium carriers. And so we've been utilizing captives in certain excess layers of risk where, where the motor carriers uh, choose to retain it uh, versus buy insurance. Uh, captives are a way to do that to, to kind of fill the gaps as you're building your liability tower. Uh, so that's, that's one way. Uh, the other area that I see as a huge uh, opportunity is in the aggregator or, or independent contractor space. Uh, so whether you're running a traditional independent contractor model or, or, or kind of adopting more of a contract carrier model, uh, a, AB5 would be a great example of this. Lots of companies are considering changing their models and, and no longer running the way they are uh, because of the Supreme Court, the, the Supreme uh, uh, Court choice to uh, not take up AB5. These small operators that, that, that move to a contract carrier model, uh, they have to go find insurance for themselves. And the insurance market for a small operator is, is very, very difficult, very, very expensive. It doesn't matter whether you're a last mile company or you're a, a traditional over the road company. And so uh, 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 these larger motor carriers that have these, these single parent captives can actually build and manage and administer insurance programs for these contract carriers. Um, that is a bit of a sticky subject uh, just because of the control and, and, and the arm's length desire to, to, to kind of stay away from these folks. Uh, but I think it's worth discussion because the benefit of providing lower cost insurance to your aggregators or to your contract carriers is what's going to set you apart uh, from a risk retention or, or, or a risk and recruitment perspective because uh, the cost of that insurance is, is a huge barrier to that transition. Uh, so those are kind of the two ways that I see that happening. In the group captive space for medium fleet companies, um, you know, really – Group captives are no different than the insurance market. Uh, they are struggling to understand the increase in claims costs, the increase in legal trends, uh, uh, the inflationary pressures. And so th there's a lot of pressure for them to get their pricing right. Um, so I'm, I think you're gonna start to see some, uh, some pricing pressure coming from these group captives, no different than what you saw uh, from the insurance market about a year ago. And so I think that that's uh, gonna be a challenge and, and, and a challenge for those that are in these group captives or thinking about these group captives uh, you know, really need to take into consideration, you know, just because you've performed, you know, you know, maybe five, six years ago, doesn't necessarily mean that the captive really understands uh, the risk going forward. Great stuff. Thank you so much for the insights. I got one last wild card question for you here, right? Uh -oh. So we were talking beforehand. Uh, recently, you've uh, um, relocated to, to Bend, Oregon. And I think, I think Bend has uh, – pretty fantastic reputation when it comes towards the outdoor lifestyle. So for those of us uh, who, who have younger families looking for that next vacation, what, what would be a couple of recommendations that you've had if you're going to take a family to Bend, Oregon and, and, and have a little vacation there? Yes, yes, so absolutely. And that's a perfect fit because this is where my family used to come on vacation during the summer and, and uh, we find ourselves now living here. And so we're uh, trying to figure out you know uh, what to do and uh, frankly, there's there's so much to do. So so there's a uh, the fifth largest mountain bike trail system in the world uh, called Phil's Trail that is very accommodating to people of all shapes and sizes, uh, professionals and young kids alike. Uh, we have a beautiful river that that flows through town, and so there's a massive floating environment uh, coming through here. Uh, we've got Mount Bachelor and the Cascade Lake Scenic Highway, and so you've got all sorts of lake activities and hiking and 
and, and things of that nature. Those, uh, and then for those that fish, which I do not, uh, the fly fishing, I am told, is fantastic. Well, you, you might have just made, uh, you created a problem for me as far as my team advocating for the next Tinny Group mid-year meeting, uh, be, lo location being Bend, Oregon. So uh, I appreciate the, uh, the recommendations, but more importantly, I appreciate you sharing terrific insights with our network. Thanks again. That's going to do it for us in the hot seat. We will see you next time.